We're working on his pronunciation of Yorkshire. Uh, he's got a ways to go, but we're we're making progress. So uh, I'd like you to turn, please, again, if you've got Bibles there um, or close by. I want to read uh, from John's Gospel tonight. So far, we've been in Luke's Gospel, but now we're going to be in John's Gospel, and we're going to look at John chapter 5. And I'm just going to read the first nine verses but we may look at double that amount. There's just uh, the first 18 verses are all very interesting. And so I'm going to read at least uh, for, to begin with verses one through nine. And of course, our subject this evening is uh, uh, hope for the broken. Uh, last night we did hope for the fallen. Tonight we want to do hope for the broken. Think about broken people this evening. So it begins this way, verse 1, it says, After this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk. That means they were powerless individuals. They couldn't do anything about their circumstances. And then it says a blind and and halt, that means that they were, uh, they, they were lame, they couldn't walk very well, uh, withered, uh, maybe they had withered hands that are just kind of, uh, maybe through a stroke or something like that, they couldn't move properly, and then waiting for the moving of the water, for an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water, and whoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in, was made whole of whatever disease he had. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity for 30 and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man. When the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus said unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed, and walked. And on the same day, it was the Sabbath. Again, that's an amazing little story, a true story of real people who met Jesus Christ, and their lives were permanently transformed. So I want to just kind of start by talking a little bit about the Gospel of John, because the Gospel of John is, like most books, it has an introduction in chapter 1. We're not going to spend a lot of time there, but in that introduction, John introduces some key themes that are going to be in the book. And one of the great themes that he introduces is this, that... As many as received him, that's Jesus, to them gave you the right, the authority, the power to become the children of God, even those that believed on his name. Okay? So what we find is the first part of the book, there's lots of people receiving Jesus. And so you have uh, examples of people called Nathaniel and Nicodemus, the woman of Samaria, the multitudes that she told to come and hear. And it just seems the first part of the book, like everybody's receiving Jesus. And it's a wonderful thing. How do they receive Jesus? It says as many as received him. It says to them that believed on his name. That's how you receive Jesus. You believe who he is and you believe everything about him. You just believe that he is the one that came to make broken people well again, that he came to die on the cross to pay for their sins. And so they believe that in Jesus, and not only did they believe on him, but their lives would never be the same again. They were completely transformed. It's a wonderful thing to receive Jesus. And in this room, there are those that have received him, and there are those that haven't received him. And it makes all the difference. On the other hand, another theme in the book is this, that he came to his own, his own people, the Jews, and his own received him not. It's kind of an interesting idea, isn't it? Just a simple idea that in the book, we're going to see there are people that receive Jesus by believing on him, and there are those that receive him not 
by not believing on him and rejecting him. And really, that's the story of the human race. There are those that receive him, and there are those that receive him not. And that's going to determine their eternal destiny, whether they received Jesus or they received him not. Whether they believed on him or they believed not on him will determine where they will spend all of eternity. What will you do with Jesus? That's the big question. So that's a great theme that comes through this particular book. So as we look at this particular chapter, I want us to just kind of work through it little by little. Uh, so it says that there's this feast of the Jews. And of course, uh, sad really, because these feasts, these religious festivals that the Jews held, originally they were called the feasts of Jehovah. They were God's feasts, but man had just turned them into human rituals. And religion doesn't really help people very much. If you came here tonight to learn about religion, you came to the wrong place. We're not about religion. We're about a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's altogether different than religion. I, I don't like religion at all. I love Jesus right. Christ, and I love a relationship with him. And that's what really matters. And so basically, uh, th this unsatisfying feast of the Jews, Jesus goes up to Jerusalem, and he, he says that, he, that in Jerusalem... There is this sheep market. Now, this sheep market's by the sheep gate. So there are several gates of Jerusalem. This is the sheep gate. And when you came into this, there was a big pool there called the Pool, pool of Bethesda. I've actually been there to Jerusalem. I, they're, they're excavating the Pool of Bethesda. I've seen it. It's huge, and it's an amazing place. It's great to see it. Yeah, and so these are real places, real people. Around it, there were these five porches that kind of surrounded the pool, and uh, what happened was uh, there were a lot of people that were laid by these in these porches by the pool. And we, we said it describes them here, what kind of people they were. And they were all sick. So I said, this world is a very broken world. When God originally made man, <laughs> he made him perfectly in the image and likeness of God. But as we look at our world, there's a lot of broken people with either broken bodies, or perhaps even more painful, broken hearts and broken lives. There's lots of brokenness. So around this pool, it's kind of a snapshot of, of what has happened to our world because sin came into the world to spoil everything. And so we have these people here. Some of them are blind. Some of them are lame. Uh, some of them, they're just powerless to change their circumstances, and they're just lying there, and they're waiting for something. They're waiting with expectation. Because somewhere along the line, at one point, there must have been some kind of moving of the water, and whoever jumped into the water first got healed. And so they were all just waiting, waiting for this water to be stirred, so they could jump in first. But obviously, the chances of getting in first weren't so good. Because our person that we're going to concentrate on, he'd been there for 38 years. It's a long time to be laying down, hoping to get in so you can get healed, and nothing happening. And I want to suggest to you what what would have happened is this, that maybe on a particular day, there'd be a stirring of the water by this angel. And all of a sudden, there'd be a, there'd be a frenzy of activity around the pool, and everybody's trying to drag themselves. Remember, they're powerless people. Uh, they're lame, they're, they're crippled, they're blind, and they're trying to move towards the pool. And as they get closer, all of a sudden, they hear splash. Somebody's gone in before them. And then they have to go back to where they started from and wait for the next time. Now, I don't know how many times that would have happened in 38 years. But I suspect that this guy is pretty jaded by now. 38 years and no healing. He's just there. Now, just so we can get a little bit of an idea of kind of how long 38 years is, when Jesus was dedicated as a baby at the temple, this man had already been there for eight years. 
when Jesus was 12 years of age and he was up in Jerusalem and he was kind of listening and talking to the teachers in, in the nation, this man had been there 20 years. And now he's been there 38 years. 38 years and still no healing. And so the Lord says an interesting thing to this man. And it's really an interesting question. He says, will thou be made whole? We could put it this way. Do you want to be made well? Now, I think that's a great question, don't you? Now, you'd say, well, why would you ask, do you want to be made well? I mean, it's obvious if he's by the pool, he wants to be made well, right? Because it's a no-brainer. That's You'd think that he really wants it. But what the Lord is saying is, do you really want to be made well? You know why he says that? Because, you see, you can get used to anything. It's amazing, isn't it, how human beings can get used to second best. They can get used to being in a position like this man. Like, just think of it. For 38 years, he's been lying there. He doesn't have to think about what shall I do tomorrow. He knows what he's going to do tomorrow. He's just going to lay there. If he gets healed, then what does he do? He might have to get a job. He might have to, I mean, what is he going to do? He just can't lay around at the pool anymore. And so the law says, do you want to be made well? That's a great question. And you see, there's a lot of people, they're not living the way God intended them to. And there's a better life for them. A much better life. But the Lord would ask that person tonight, do you want to be made well? Because he can make you well, but you have to want it. And sometimes you're so used to whatever bondage you're in, whatever thing it is that's just destroying your life, you get so used to that. It's almost like the sin that's destroying you becomes like a friend. You can't imagine life without it. And he's saying, I've got a better option for you, but do you want it? Do you want to be made well? And what the sick man says, he says in verse 7, the impotent man answered him, Sir, I don't have any man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. He says, really, what I need is a friend. If I just had a friend, he might be able to help me to get in, right? See, and, and there's good reason for that. There was another man who was very sick, and four men helped him to get to Jesus so he could get well. So he thought, if I could just have a friend, and yet the interesting thing is, the person that's talking to him is the best friend a person could ever have. What a friend, we often sing it, we have in Jesus. There's no better friend than him. And so he said, if I just had a friend, that somebody could help me get in when the water's stirred. So Jesus, the perfect friend, says something Quite remarkable to him, he says, rise, take up your bed, and walk. Now, that seems an impossible thing, doesn't it? Like he's been there for 38 years. I'm assuming that he's never walked for 38 years, because he's just been lying there. And so to say to somebody who has never walked for 38 years, rise, take up your bed, and walk, seems an impossibility. And maybe to some of you, the idea that Jesus could actually change your life seems an absolute impossibility. Some of us in my uh, days before I became a believer in Christ, I was a drunkard and I couldn't imagine life without drink. And I had tried even to give it up and I couldn't. And I came to Christ and he absolutely delivered me from it. And that's what Jesus does. He completely delivers people. He, he helps people to do what seems to be impossible with him is possible. And so this seems impossible. Right? Take up your bed and walk. But notice what it says, verse 9. Immediately the man was made whole, took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath day. Now I just want you to think about this. Here's a man. He hasn't walked for 38 years. Now, even if Jesus fixed what was wrong with his legs, what would happen here if you got, you know, kind of corrective surgery for what has prevented you from walking? What would happen next? 
You have to yeah. learn to walk, but your problem is you haven't used your muscles for 38 years. So you'd be in physiotherapy for probably another 38 years. Well, not exactly, but for a long time, wouldn't you? When Jesus heals somebody, it's immediate. Immediately. And it completely, he gets up and he walks. He's a completely new man. And of course, we, we get this, that it was done on a Sabbath day. Of course, the Jews, you know, they're just so legalistic that instead of rejoicing that their fellow Israelite, that they couldn't do anything to help, religion couldn't help him for 38 years, instead of rejoicing that their fellow Israelite is now walking again and he's got a whole new life, they say, it's the Sabbath. You're not supposed to do that on a Sabbath. You're not supposed to carry your bed. What do you think you're doing? It's amazing, isn't it, how religion operates. It's so different to the grace that the Lord Jesus brings. And so, he says, he answered and said, he that made me whole, the same said to me, take up your bed and walk. And what he's saying is, if he can, if he can do this, well, I better obey him when he says, Take up your bed and walk, right? Because if he can do this to me, he's worthy to be obeyed. Then they asked him what man it was. And the amazing thing is, he didn't even know who it was that had done it to him. It says um, He said he, was, he that was healed did not know who it was, but Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. But afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple, and he said to him, Behold... You're made whole. And then he says this startling thing. Sin no more, lest a worst thing come unto thee. Wow. Sin no more. Well, that's challenging, isn't it? How do you sin no more, lest something worse? And then you think to yourself, what could be worse than this, you know, kind of 38 years of frustration, laying at the pool, trying to get in, the water goes splash, and it's too late, you, you missed it, and you've been doing that for 38 years. 38 years of frustration trying to get into a pool, what, what could be worse than that? Well, I'll tell you what could be worse than that. Being in a lake of fire for all eternity, and you can't get out. Here's a pool 38 years and you can't get in. That's frustrating enough. But imagine being in a place called the Lake of Fire, which the Bible speaks of as a real place, and being there forever and ever and ever and ever. And there's no hope of ever getting out. I think that would be worse, don't you? And you see, that's why Jesus came. He came for broken people, and he came to make them whole. And how did, he, how did he come to do that? How did he do that? Well, the problem is that sin has caused the problem. That's why the world is a broken world, because of sin. Because our first father, Adam, sinned, and the whole world was plunged into darkness. And we're sinners, too. So here we are in this sinful world, we're sinful people, and Jesus came to get to the root problem of it all, the problem of sin. So what did he do? Well, the first thing he, was that he was absolutely sinless. He was perfect in every way. And he was the only one who didn't deserve death and didn't deserve hell and, and, and could have gone back to heaven and been welcomed in without any problem because he was perfect in every way. But he went to a place called Calvary, and there, on the cross, he bore in his own body, on that tree, our sin. And he took the punishment that we rightly deserved on Calvary's cross so that we could be forgiven, <laughs> that all our sins could be forgiven. We could have a new life, a new start, a new beginning. Now, I want to tell you... We're talking about real hope. I don't think there's a more hopeful message than this, that tonight you can have a new beginning, a new start, a new life, and all your sins forgiven. That's a very hopeful message. 
and, and not, it's not just hopeful, certain of, e of an eternity with Christ if you just come and believe the simple message of the gospel. It's that simple. And so notice in verse 15, it says, the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. Here's a man who was a broken man, and now it says Jesus had made him whole. Isn't that beautiful? Now, what I could say tonight is this, that Jesus is in the business of taking broken men, broken women, broken people, and making them completely whole again. And he wants to do that. But, but he's asking a very important question of you this evening, and that is this. Do you want to be made well? Because if you want to, he can make you well. He can change your life so dramatically you can't even imagine the difference that he can make to your life. But you have to come to him. And you have to say, I'm not very well. I know I'm broken. And I need you to make me whole. I, I'm a sinner. And that's my root problem. And I need you to deal with it for me on Calvary's cross. And he did. He did that willingly. But we just have to accept what he did. And so this man is now made whole. Therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus, sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. And then it says this, Jesus answered them, my father works up to now and I work. Therefore, the Jews sought more to kill him because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. I just want to kind of finish with this simple thought. It is a really simple thought, but Jesus is saying this. When he finished the creation, in six days, he created the world, and then it says he rested. And that's where the Sabbath comes from. But now what Jesus is saying is, because sin has come into this world and broken it all, he said, how, can, how could my father rest when the world's like this, full of all this brokenness? How can I rest when the world's like this, full of all this brokenness? We can't rest while it's like this. We can't rest until people are made whole again. Amen. So the father's working. The son is working. And I believe the Holy Spirit is working tonight to bring people to see they need him in their brokenness. Maybe you have a broken body. Maybe you have a broken heart, which is very hard to heal. But Jesus <laughs> says he heals the broken heart. Isn't that amazing? And he wants to do it. And he wants to do it tonight. He wants to do it for you, but he's not going to force it on you. Just look same as this man. He just is a perfect gentleman. He says, do you want to be made well? And he's saying to you tonight, do you want to be made well? If you want to be made well, it's really very simple. We said it this morning. It's as simple as ABC. It don't get more simple than that, does it? I love just ABC, don't you? I mean, everybody can. Everybody knows their A, B, C, don't they? <clears throat> a is just simply admitting that you are broken, that you're a sinner, <laughs> that you, you desperately need help. That's the first and the most important thing, just acknowledging your condition. And then the B is you have to, do you remember how did people receive him? As many as received him, how did they receive him? By believing on his name. You have to believe that Jesus is who we claim to be, that he's the one that came to save you on the cross by dying for your sin, was buried and rose again the third day. You have to believe that he did it for you. So I believed all my life that he did those things, but the, 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 the change, the real change came when I realized personally it was for me that he died. It was me that he had to go into death. It was for me that he has now risen again to show that my sin has been paid for. It's when it when it became personal. So admit, believe, and then simply just call on him. Whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you can do that right in your seat. And, and it's amazing. I, I know people who 
in a drunken stupor, called out for God to save them. And when they woke up the next day, they were new creatures. Can you believe that? You don't have to be full. You just have to be, see, I need it. I need this. And call upon him. And he is mighty to save. He delights to save. He delights to take the broken things and make them beautiful again. That's exactly what he can do to your life if you willingly come to him. We we urge you to do this. That, that's why we're doing this. We're not doing this just for our entertainment. We're doing it because this your eternity depends on this. Do you remember what we said? What's more frustrating than trying to get into a pool? What's worse than that? Being in the lake of fire and you can't get out. That's much worse. We don't want that for anybody. We want you to come to Christ. So I'm going to close now in a word of prayer. If you want to talk to us afterwards, we'd love to talk to you. We have some booklets. Uh, we, we just would urge you to consider these things. Father, we pray tonight again. You know the hearts of those that are bowed in your presence. And you know the people that are broken and need to be made whole again. But Lord, pray that they would know it and they would admit it and acknowledge it and simply receive the Lord Jesus by believing in his name. So we pray for this. We pray you'll bless our time now as we discuss things together, as we uh, have some refreshments. We ask your blessing on these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.